Okay, so we had how either ep we were using epinephrine or glycogon, glucagon, you know, and speak today. And of course, epinephrine is the easier one to talk about because it's the fight or flight. It triggers GPCRs, which activated this, the adenyl cyclase eventually, which caused CAMP to then act PKA, which phosphorylates the new player that we hadn't heard before, which was perilipin A. And perilipin A, what it does is it recruits the hormone sensitive lipases so that they can come to the, the, uh, the membrane of the adipocyte, or the lipid droplet, if you want to think of it that way, in order to hydrolyze to the three free fatty acids and, and then glycerol. And glycerol goes to glycolysis. And did we actually say how glycerol, what part of glycolysis it went to? Or did we leave off on a cliffhanger? You think it was a cliffhanger? Yeah. <laughs> Okay, and so, yes, it undergoes to uh, glycolysis. And so this is where I do believe that we left off. Okay, and so this is glycerol to glycerol 3 phosphate, which actually this is related to one of the questions on the exam. I'm almost finished grading the exam. I'm on question five, which takes the longest to grade since it's sort of like a choose your own adventure. And this was one of the questions, actually related to one of the questions, which I think was also one of the suggested problems that I had given you um, about how which glycolytic intermediate could be transformed to, to glycerol, you know, to make the, the fats, essentially glycerol 3 phosphate. And by the way, it's DHAP, as you can see here. And one of the easy ways to, to do that or to know that is, let's just review this part is that, if you remember what glycerol looks like, how many carbons are in glycerol? Three. Three. And what, um, <clears throat> what does it, what makes glycerol glycerol? Three alcohols. Three alcohols. And glycerol 3-phosphate on the third one would have the phosphate. And so it was just asking which glycolytic intermediate essentially looks like that. Well, dihydroxyacetone phosphate looks identical to that, except what does the acetone part? I mean, what's what the only difference? What makes an acetone different than an alcohol? It's a ketone. If it's dihydroxy, that means, and acetone, where's the ketone at? Well, there's only one place to even have a ketone on this one. Second carbon, okay, and so we just erase this, la 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 la, and that's it, okay. And so that's why DHAP was actually the answer to that question. Um, some people, uh, I haven't graded all. I think this is actually the one that I'm stuck on grading right now. And some people that answered this question actually came really close so far. I can't remember if anyone the ones I've graded actually got it all the way right. I think some people had DHAP, but then they had the wrong enzyme. Okay. All right, so let's go back here. So we have glycerol, and glycerol is going to go on to become glycerol 3-phosphate at the expense of ATP. So what class or classes of enzymes could this be? Kinase. kinase. If you're going to name this one, what could you name it? Glycerol kinase. Glycerol kinase. Oh, yeah. Which... Come on, you can do it. I thought you were saying there we go. wrong. <laughs> no, I was just talking to the computer. I don't have a name for this computer. It's not like Voldemort or anything, <laughs> like some people. Which, you do know where Voldemort was born. It's on TV. What? No. Like Eagleton, actors? Indiana. Nuh-uh. -uh. Yeah, it's on an episode of Parks and Rec. When the episode where Leslie Note finds out that she was born oh, in yeah. Eagleton, she's like, you know, Voldemort was probably born in Eagleton. How did you? I'm not even an HP fan, and, and I picked up on that one. I forgot about that one. My favorite one is still <laughs> Star Wars. Is that the one with the little boy? Yes, <laughs> that's my, my favorite. Okay, so now we have glycerol 3 phosphate, which becomes DHAP using an NAD, okay? So what class or classes of enzymes utilize NAD? And do this? Dehydrogenase. Dehydrogenase. And so what were you going to name this one if you can name it? 
See, you guys are on a roll. I told you, once you learn your class of enzymes, it's half the battle, or maybe even more than half the battle. And of course, DHAP is part of glycolysis, that in order for it to go on, ultimately to make pyruvate and, and um, oh no, that, the NADH itself also goes on to make, uh, you know, is used to make ATP. And that's the whole purpose of this, is we're trying to utilize all the parts of our fat in order to escape from that bear. Once again, running downhill, not uphill. Um, <laughs> so what enzyme can turn DHAP into glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate? Bing, bing, bing. We are now at, that was step five, by the way, of glycolysis for those who remembered it according to numbers. And so, yeah, the TPI, treose, treose phosphate isomerase. So that's how we literally utilize the backbone of the triglyceride <coughs> storage fat. So now we're going to go back to show this little cartoon, which actually, I, I mean, I really like this because it, this goes through all, we have the hormone, like epinephrine, it binds to the GPCR, which was where the GTP was hydrolyzed and everything that Lorraine had mentioned in the last class. Travels, I remembered, travels to adenyl cyclase, which then turns ATP to cyclic AMP, which activates PKA. PKA actually does two things, okay? One is it's going to activate the perilipin A, which will mobilize the lipases to the membrane, and it also will phosphorylate the membrane, uh, the lipase to make it active. And that will cleave off the glycerol, which can enter into glycolysis. And at the same time, the free fatty acids then can go to the albumin, which remember those are like the taxi cabs or the transportation, the serum albumin, which will take it until it gets to whatever cell needs it, which has a transporter, which will then free it up to go inside that myocyte of the brain, uh, yeah, the myocyte, in order to, whoops, undergo beta oxidation, ultimately to make ATP and get off carbon dioxide. Okay. <clears throat> Are there any questions of, of this? Beta oxidation, by the way, only has four steps. It's a relatively simple, even though it has some that, can be difficult to say, at least for me. I almost undo years of speech therapy when I try to say some of these fatty acid enzymes. Okay. I'm sorry. Oh, yeah. Um, so you said we used to form epinephrine. Right. Epinephrine is one way. Mm -hmm. Glucagon is another one that does this. Because it's about more epinephrine. Right. Pardon? Well, norepinephrine would be a different, uses a different receptor than epinephrine. I don't know if it actually undergoes fatty acid hydrolysis, though, if that's one of its effects or not. But it, norepinephrine comes from epinephrine. We're going to talk about that in Chapter 24. But, yep. Okay, and so once the free fatty acids reach the target cell, reach that muscle so that you can run away from the bear downhill once again, much like for faith integration, Moses in the Holy Land, um, the free fatty acids cannot directly cross through the mitochondrial membranes. Okay? So it has to use a transporter, but the transporter doesn't recognize the free fatty acid. It's like, no, you can't come in here. And so it has to be activated. And it's activated by our good friend, coenzyme A, COASH. You want to think of that. Which. I'm sure it can have some really interesting mnemonic devices or hip-hop songs or whatever, which I don't know if you guys have seen the blog, but I'm sorry, but that one Dr. W or Professor W or Mr. W, whatever, that's really, really sad. And it's really sad that he sells those songs on, like, he's iTunes. I, I know that he's got, like, a following. Yeah. I was a little, I don't know if you read it in the comments, but there's, like, Middle-aged women that were writing saying that how they find him sexy. I'm really hoping that that's a joke. <laughs> but I can see there's nothing house sexy house. about Crohn's. <laughs> <laughs> yes, well, that is Crohn's true. Crohn's disease that you're looking at? Uh, I, I, I think it's Crohn's or colitis, ulcerative colitis. And someone turned that. So, right. I just ate. <laughs> <laughs> 
All right, so here we go. This one, unfortunately, came from the old book, so it's not nearly as pretty to look at. But first of all, I want to stress the difference between acetyl and acyl. Acetyl really is just two carbons, because the A-C-E-T, acet, means two. And acyl means R with a carbonyl attached. So it could be acetyl, or it could be 20 carbons long. Okay, So that's why, just in general, acyl just means, you know, it's any R group you know, with a carbonyl. So what happens here is the first step requires an ATP to make this acyl adenylated intermediate. And then acetyl-CoA is um, attached. And, one, and the reason why is AMP is a great leaving group. So then we can have the thiol, the sulfurs, both a good leaving group and a good nucleophile. It comes in, smacks the carbon of the carbonyl. You get your tetrahedral intermediate, which you've seen over and over and over again in organic chem 2. You get collapse of the tetrahedral intermediate, and it kicks off the AMP, and we have this activated acyl group. It's, called, it's activated because it has the um, coenzyme A on it. Okay? So overall, you use up an ATP, but you're making this acyl, you know, um, thioester. So what class or classes of enzymes could this be? Synthetase. Synthetase. You're on fire today. I'm on fire. <laughs> yeah. Oh, so oh, oh, oh. yeah. <laughs> so this has the really generic name of acyl-CoA synthetase. It could be acetyl-CoA or it could be Dodecocetal. <laughs> Dodec I can't even say it, so 20. I guess Dodec is 12, so never mind. But whatever the 20 is, I can't remember what the name for it is. Arachidonic. <clears throat> okay. So it's just acyl CoA synthetase. A lot of these fatty acid enzymes will just have acyl as a generic name. And people a lot of times forget and they put acetyl, which technically it only means two. And it is not a transferase, okay, because we are making something here. We're not just transferring it. All right, so now that we have the, the, well, oh, I think it has fallen asleep or has died. There we go. It, the activated acyl-CoA, it can cross through that outer membrane, but it can't get through the inner membrane, the holy of holies of the mitochondria. Faith integration number two. I am I'm on a roll today. <laughs> the bang. Okay, so <laughs> this is where a good friend carnitine. This is I think the first time that we've actually talked or discussed carnitine. But this is where carnitine comes in, and there's an enzyme that's on both leaflets of the inner membrane. So it, it's on both sides. It's the same enzyme. I I use this cartoon, but sometimes it gets lost. But this is the exact same enzyme. It's just located in two different places. And what it does is it takes a carnitine and it kicks off the coenzyme A, so that way the coenzyme A can go back out into the cytosol to come in and grab the next free fatty acid. And you have an acyl carnitine, or carnitinylated acyl group, or I guess an acylated carnitine group, tomato, tomato, half full, half empty, whatever. Okay, and then our transporters are called the acyl carnitine carnitine transporters, which are a mouthful. But there's a transporter that can then take it on in to the holy of holies there, where that enzyme can just do the reversal. So now this can undergo beta oxidation. So remember, it's always important to know where each metabolic pathway occurs. Beta oxidation is in the mitochondrial matrix. Where was glycolysis at? Cytosol. Cytosol, okay. Where was gluconeogenesis at? That's kind of a tricky one. Remember, it's in the matrix and in the cytosol because you have the ones that you, you have it where it depends on where it's originated from and how it has to go through the immediate dehydrogenase complex, uh, not complex, immediate dehydrogenase in order for the OAA and the effective groups and blah, blah, blah. Most of it occurs in the, in, whoops, in the cytosol, but there is part of it that can occur in the matrix. What about, for the most part, where does citric acid cycle occur? It's in the matrix. The only enzyme of the one that's not fully in the matrix was succinate dehydrogenase, 
which is the ones in the inner membrane of mitochondria. That was one of the other exam questions. A lot of people said myelin dehydrogenase, but the question said which one's in the inner membrane. Myelin dehydrogenase is in the cytosol and the matrix of the inner membrane. So you got partial credit, but you didn't get all of it. Okay. And so now beta oxidation takes place in the mitochondrial matrix. Can I, uh, okay, so after your after the oxidation and activation, it meets up, I guess, with carnitine and mm-hmm. the acyl carnitine puts it on the transporter. Right. It, it can it can pass through. Okay. If this was a subway, it's its ticket to get through. So what kind of enzyme do you suppose could take a carnitine? and kick off, add it to the acyl group, and kick off the coash. Transferase. This is a transferase, and if you were going to name it, what would you name it? Carnitine transferase. A what? Carnitine transferase. This is a carnitine acyl transferase, yeah. So someone got it, because it's carnitine, and it's transferring the acyl group to it. Okay. So not, not too difficult. These are relatively... Simple enzyme names, nothing like enolase or aldolase, at least not yet. Okay? And then that's when actual beta oxidation can now occur. So, are there any questions over 